Welcome back everyone to the Damage Report, I'm John Adrola. We got a big show for you today because CNN had a big buttload of town halls yesterday. And I guess get ready for the next year because a lot of what I am personally concerned with, especially as we get more and more into this Democratic primary, is trying to decipher from this gigantic crowd of candidates, what do they actually believe about the issues that matter? What are their actual values? And Look, you can listen to their speeches and stuff, and I often do. Maybe you'll learn something, but I want to put some pressure on them. And the town hall environment provides a little bit of that. And so throughout the course of the show today, we've got big disagreements between a couple of the different candidates on, I guess, reenfranchising people who had committed felonies and also potentially giving the vote to people currently serving sentences in prison. Some for it, some against it. We're going to talk about that. And also, what I would argue is CNN, yeah, it was CNN. A very disingenuous attempt to hurt Bernie Sanders on that issue. We will describe that for you. But we also have disagreements on impeachment. We're gonna break down a couple of different candidates' positions on that. And actually, a little bit of updating polling on the release of the Mueller report. Has it changed people's mind on Donald Trump, his culpability, what should be done in the future? We've got those numbers. We're gonna close out the show with that. And along the way, we've got a couple of awesome guests for you. So if you've been watching the damage report, you know that we have been engaged in an ongoing attempt to break down the finances and fundraising of all of these different primary contenders. And we are actually losing ground because more are announcing than we are covering. But today, Sarah Kleiner of the Center for Public Integrity is gonna be joining us to talk about Tim Ryan, longtime Ohio Congressman. How is he actually funding his presidential bid? And Mark Friedenberg is running in a special election for Congress for Congress in Pennsylvania's 12th district. We're gonna be talking about him, what his campaign is all about. We've got, I think, about a month until that election. So um, exciting stuff, and we're gonna jump right into it now. Bernie Sanders, what does he think about extending the vote, not just to people who have served time in prison and are now out, they've paid their debt to society as we say, but are actually still in prison. And in particular, what about people who are serving terms for particularly heinous or violent crimes? He was asked a question at last night's CNN Town Hall. And the first, the way it was worded was, was admittedly rough. It was a young woman who was saying, why should people who are in prison for having committed sexual assaults be able to vote? And obviously tough question, here is how Bernie Sanders answered it. We live in a moment where cowardly Republican governors are trying to suppress the vote. And in fact, right here, as you may know, in New Hampshire, the legislature and the governor are working hard to make it more difficult for young people to vote. And to me, that is an incredibly undemocratic, un-American Process. And I say to those people, by the way, if you don't have the guts to participate in free and fair elections, you should get another job and get out of politics. All right, so we got to. So here is, and to answer your question, as it happens in my own state of Vermont, from the very first days of our state's history, what our Constitution says is that everybody can vote. That is true, so people in jail can vote. Now here is my view. If somebody commits a serious crime, sexual assault, murder, they're gonna be punished. They may be in jail for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, their whole lives. That's what happens when you commit a serious crime. But I think the right to vote is inherent to our democracy. Yes, even for terrible people. Because once you start chipping away and you say, well, that guy committed a terrible crime, not gonna let him vote, or that person did that, not gonna let that person vote, you're running down a slippery slope. So I believe that people who commit crimes, they pay the price. When they got out of jail, I believe they certainly should have the right to vote. But I do believe that even if they are in jail, they're paying their price to society, but that should not take away their inherent American right to participate in our democracy. So look, I think that was a good response for a couple of different reasons. In general, the philosophy that he has towards democracy and voting rights, what he is making clear is that this is not a level playing field. Almost nothing in American politics is in terms of intensity that the different sides approach these different topics. So the people who are fighting to constrain our democracy to continually cut people out of access to the vote, either literally by the law or in effect their ability to actually vote and you know register and all of that 
they are very committed to that task. And that's why across the country, we see Republican governors in lockstep pushing for things like voter ID and shutting down polling places and purging voter rolls. They all just mysteriously converge on these tactics and they've been deploying them as often as possible, every chance that they get for, well, as long as we've been alive. But it seems in the last decade or so to be particularly bad. On the other side, there are a lot of people that think that every American should be able to vote and that every American should have access to the vote meaningfully in an easy fashion, increasing how easy it is to register and all of that. But I would argue that those people are not fighting as hard in elected office, people who believe that as those who are trying to shut down the vote. And that is why we need a politician who believes that we need to be doing everything we can and thinking in innovative ways about how to strengthen democracy against the various assaults that it's sustained over the past decade or longer. And so that is why he cares about making sure that even people in prison can vote. And it is the way that the question was worded him was tough. I mean, nobody wants to, to talk about rights for people who've committed sexual assault. Um, but I think that he responded well. And I mean, think about it. People who end up in prison, in general, aside from, you know, completely nonviolent drug related crimes and stuff like that, like some people will think that they should be deprived of all rights. It's easy in some cases. You take someone who's committed sexual assault, someone who's committed murder, you know, uh, you know, violent pedophiles, things like that. Nobody wants to defend those people. But you can start to, like he said, it's a slippery slope. You can start to widen that circle more and more. And very often, bringing up a slippery slope, I would say, is often a dodge in politics. It's difficult to imagine how we would actually descend down that slippery slope. But in this case, this is not a hypothetical. This is not a concern that if you start to cut people out of the vote, maybe they will try to expand that. We're in the middle of that expansion. It's expanding right now. More and more people are having a harder and harder time voting. And that's why I think that him bringing up the sort of specter of of a slippery slope, I think is 100% correct. And again, even in the case of this town hall, I would argue that it is not hypothetical that people would would try to make you out to be the villain if you are as Bernie Sanders is and as some others in this Democratic primary are trying to expand the vote. It took just a second actually. So we, we ran through that bit of the video. I wanna resume one second later and look at what direction the moderator for that town hall, Chris Cuomo decides to take it in. Applause for the answer. My follow question goes to this being like you're writing an opposition ad against you by saying you think the Boston Marathon bomber should vote not after he pays his debt to society, but while he's in jail. You sure about that? Well, Chris, I think I have written many 30 second opposition ads throughout my life. (laughs) This will be just another one, but I do believe, look, you know, this is what I believe. Do you believe in democracy? Do you believe that every single American 18 years of age or older who's an American citizen has the right to vote? Once you start chipping away at that, believe me, that's what our Republican governors all over this country are doing. They come up with all kinds of excuses why people of color, young people, poor people can't vote. And I will do everything I can to resist it. This is a democracy. We've got to expand that democracy. And I believe every single person does have the right to vote. So uh, look, there are a lot of potential explanations as to why Chris Cuomo used that particular example. Why am I going to come up with, like, I guess, arguably one of the worst people, you know, currently locked up in America? It could be that Chris Cuomo is genuinely concerned about how the Boston Marathon bomber would use his vote, who he'd support. That he actually stays up late at night worrying that that one vote would throw an election or that it would get another violent criminal elected into political office. It's possible. I, I, do you believe that that's why? I think it was to generate headlines because he knows that Bernie has obviously thought about that obvious follow up. And so Bernie is not going to simply say, "Oh, Boston Marathon bomber, you're right, I hadn't thought of that. You know what, actually, I don't support people in prison voting. I, I backtrack entirely, no, he's gonna be consistent. All that this does is generate a headline. And the headline is not Bernie Sanders supports expansion of voting rights, Bernie Sanders supports vibrant democracy. The headlines now look like this, Sanders, Boston Marathon bomber should be able to vote from prison. Or if you do a little bit of Googling, you can come up with a whole bunch of other articles. Sanders says the right to vote should be extended even for terrible people like Boston Marathon bomber. Bernie Sanders says Boston Marathon bomber, sexual assaulters should be video. Bernie Sanders says even terrible people like the Boston Marathon bomber. 
We're talking about fundamentally what approach we're going to have to the future of American democracy and expanding the vote. We could have that conversation or we could be diverted into this, what is this one particularly bad person going to do with their vote? And it is such a disingenuous attempt to both derail that conversation, to stop any actual reform to voting rights in America, but also individually to hurt Bernie Sanders. He didn't, he came up with that so fast, it was in his mind. You know that there's lots of terrible people we could mention. And I ask you, are you more worried about what that one individual would do with his vote that you are willing to say to all of the other people in prison, you should have no influence over the future of this country? Do you actually believe that? I don't think Chris Cuomo really believes that, but his question implies that. And he even starts off saying, you're writing an opposition piece for you, but it's not good enough. I'm gonna make it better. I'm gonna generate these headlines and generate a bad news cycle for you while you are doing what seems like an objectively good thing in pursuing your progressive values that say that more people should be able to vote. And the thing is, maybe it seems clever to somebody, it doesn't seem clever to me. You can do this on almost anything if you want to. So the next politician that comes up and says, I want a tax cut for every American. My fall question is going to be, "Oh, that sounds good. You want a tax cut for everyone. Well, there are countless thousands of people who've committed assault and weren't caught. People who've raped and haven't been caught. There are people out there who murdered and weren't caught. You wanna give all of those murderers and rapists tax cuts? You wanna, st- you wanna stick dollars in the pockets of murderers and rapists? Is that a fair question? Of course not. Of course, that's not the point of the policy. That's not the spirit of the policy, whether I agree with the policy or not. That's not what Bernie Sanders is trying to accomplish. His goal is not to make sure that a murderer has more say in what happens in this country. It is to hold up what is best in American democracy. And the thing is, you do lose a lot of rights when you go to prison. Obviously, you can't leave if you want to. But does anyone believe that a person who's in there for tax fraud, shouldn't have any say over literally the future of prison policy in this country. Like, And again, I understand that what I am doing right now in standing up for the rights of people who I fundamentally disagree with, some of whom are terrible people, I suffer the same potential risk that Bernie Sanders suffers. Nobody wants to stand up for these people because of the, the threat, the stigma, the fact that it will seem like you prefer those people over others when that's not at all what you're doing. And I hate these diversions. It reminds me of back during the 2016 election when Bernie Sanders had his higher education policy, Hillary Clinton had hers. They were fundamentally different. Hers had some good things to it. I was not fundamentally opposed to all of what she was saying. I liked his four years of free public education more. And there were arguments against it, good ones and bad ones. And one bad one that was deployed by Hillary Clinton was Bernie Sanders wants to make it free for Donald Trump's children to go to public schools. That is such a disingenuous argument. And it's it's a way to make us stab ourselves, a way to make us not support what is in our own economic best interests. That I would say all the kids that could benefit from free four years of public education shouldn't get that right because I'm worried that that Baron Trump is gonna go to Yukon. Does it does anybody actually does anybody actually follow that argument through to its natural conclusion? No. The goal is to distract you, it is to divert you, it is to cause you to not support what is in your own best interest. When it comes to voting rights, in the one case, education in the other. There are millions of people in America's prisons. Some of them are domestic terrorists, some of them are murderers, lots of them aren't. Lots of them are in prison because our entire justice system is fundamentally screwed up and they shouldn't be there. They shouldn't have been there in the first place or many of them certainly shouldn't have been there for as long as they were. Should those people have no say in what happens in their country? I don't actually believe that. I don't think that most people do, and I hope that they're able to see through these sorts of political games. But as one example that this is working, that that strategy that you saw in the town hall is working, Don Jr. tweeted, what does it say about the modern day Democrat party that Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris seem more concerned about giving mass murderers like the Boston Marathon bomber voting rights than protecting the civil rights of law abiding American citizens who legally own guns? Just so obviously I hate that, quick note, look at that. He says they wanna give these murders the right to vote rather than, and note he doesn't say then to make it easier for people not in prison to vote. He totally forgets about the voting thing and turns to gun rights. Uh, By the way, Kamala Harris does deserve some credit. She said that this is a conversation uh, that we should have, expanding the the vote to them. Um, That's not as good as saying that they should be able to vote or that, you know, but it's something. So I will give her that much support at least. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. We come back, lots more to get to.
We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Just a few months ago, Democrats finally took control of the House, uh, but with uh, some special elections coming up, they're looking to potentially expand their majority and they have an opportunity coming up uh, not far in the future in Pennsylvania's 12th district, a special election for Congress. And we are joined now by a, a candidate in that race, that is Mark Friedenberg. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, glad to have you here. So uh, tell me about this special election. So you are following up from uh, a previous run for Congress, it was actually a resignation. So uh, what's going on in the 12th district? Yeah, Tom Marino resigned in January and I was eager to hit the ground running, pick up where we left off, uh, keep building momentum until May 21st. I think it's absolutely critical that Democrats show that they can compete and win in rural Pennsylvania if we're gonna take back the White House next year. Did he, uh, I, I guess I, I must have missed that resignation, but what were, what were the situation under, under which he resigned? Uh, first, he said he had a private sector job, and then uh, he said it was for health reasons. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's an opportunity. And having for myself run before, we got name recognition across the district. This is huge. It's a quarter of the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're really, uh, this is a grassroots campaign. We've got a great field operation, offices all across the district. And letting people know about the special election on May 21st is really one of the bigger challenges that we're facing. Yeah, so you uh, you mentioned this is uh, rural Pennsylvania. Um, I, I don't know, people who might not be familiar with Pennsylvania might not know that Pennsylvania has some some pretty conservative areas. So um, it this, does. Is, this is not necessarily the, the easiest territory uh, for a Democrat, like it, it, you know, it favored Donald Trump. So um, So tell me about that challenge. Uh, in winning over some of these voters to the Democratic side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, in many cases, we can point to what President Trump campaigned on: better, cheaper health care for everybody and the infrastructure plan. These are two uh, campaign promises that seem to have been forgotten, uh, but that are actually really important to me. Uh, making sure that we defend the Affordable Care Act, and I actually support uh, Medicare for all, or at least a Medicare option. This is a district that really needs it. Uh, my opponent wanted to make sure that Pennsylvania didn't participate in the Medicaid expansion under the ACA. That program has done so much good for this district. And he supports President Trump's tax cuts, uh, which added $1.5 trillion to the deficit, now being supported by the radical Club for Growth. My opponent, Fred Keller, is interested in making sure that we cut Social Security, too. These are programs that are incredibly popular in the district on a bipartisan basis. Uh, not surprisingly. And uh, so you mentioned a couple policies there that I would like to focus a little bit on. So you said uh, you're in favor of uh, Medicare for all or, or an option. Um, some national Democrats seem to think that running on something like Medicare for all is, is too risky, even in a, you know, like a purple district, let alone you know, a rural tending towards more conservative district, but you're, you're not afraid of running on something like that. No, absolutely not. Aside from it being the right thing, it's actually popular in the district. People saw from the attempt to repeal the ACA with absolutely no plan in place in 2017, 
people rising up against that all across the country, including in the 12th district. People know that the government has a role to play in at least ensuring, uh, guaranteeing access to affordable health care. Uh, it's really popular and they see how well the Medicare program works. So we're just a, a day off of uh, Earth Day uh, 2019 and, and I noticed uh, that you had been endorsed by the Sierra Club. So talk to me about the environment and, and your policies around that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I teach at Penn State cybersecurity, cyber law. I'm a scientist of a kind, and the signs uh, are clear that man-made climate change is a grave threat to our district. We already, it's our planet, but our district in particular, we have already had far more severe uh, flooding and, and storms than, than we've ever had before, and with increasing frequency. Um, but in Pennsylvania, we've been leaders in the last three energy revolutions in coal and oil, natural gas. I think we're in a great position to be leaders in the fourth energy revolution in renewables. We've got the universities, folks doing the research. We have the manufacturing base and we have the skilled workforce to do the maintenance and installation. Already in Pennsylvania, we have more solar installers than we do coal workers. People may not realize that. And voters uh, you know, on both sides, uh, I think, are, are ready to, uh, they, they realize the facts on the ground. They know we need to make a change. So I'm curious, especially because I don't necessarily talk to a lot of candidates from very rural districts. When you're when you're talking with voters, I mean, you've talked about a number of different issues here in this interview. What is getting the most traction? What what is bringing over the most people to your campaign so far in your experience? Social security is a big one, and actually one that I haven't mentioned yet is rural broadband connectivity. Huge parts of this district are not connected to the internet simply because it would be unprofitable for the Comcasts of the world to to wire them up. And that's leading to brain drain, which is really one of the, the top issues that I see when students graduate, they leave the 12th district and, and they don't come back. Uh, that holds down our economy. It leads to, frankly, just people being lonely, quality of life and, and health issues. Um, but this is absolutely, a you know, if, if it's important for everybody to have phone service, if, if rural electrification was important, I think it's just as important that everybody have access to, to high speed internet. And when the uh, private market isn't willing or able to deliver it, I think it's time for the government to step in and make sure that everybody's got that equal opportunity to succeed. Everybody wants high speed internet. Interesting, so a uh, wide range of issues. Uh, I, I'm assuming, I mean, as with uh, special elections in the last cycle, like the eyes of the country are gonna be on this to see if Democrats can continue their momentum from the midterm elections. So uh, for, for people watching, especially those who might be in your district, um, I mean, they might be familiar already, but uh, when is the election and where can people get more information of, about your campaign? The election is Tuesday, May 21st, it's the same day as primary day. Uh, but even if you're not a Democrat or Republican registered, independent, third party, you can vote on May 21st, nevertheless. Uh, more information is at my website, markforpa.com, M-A-R-C-F-O-R-P-A.com. Uh, we could certainly use support because I agree, eyes of the country are gonna be on this race. And if folks are interested in helping out, maybe doing some phone banking, uh, they can sign up through the website as well. And uh, we certainly advise people uh, to get involved in their democracy and this could be a good opportunity for that. Mark Friedenberg, uh, candidate in the special election, Pennsylvania's 12th district. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, more from last night's uh, mega run of town halls after this. So now Bernie Sanders on the record strongly in favor of voting both for released previous felons and and also people still in prison and Kamala Harris is interested in having that conversation. Here is another one from last night's town hall. This is Pete Buttigieg asked the same question. Senator Sanders earlier this evening said he's in favor of felons being able to vote even while serving their prison terms. He was asked specifically about people like the Boston Marathon bomber, people convicted of sexual assault. Uh, rape and other things, pedophiles. He said the right to vote is inherent to our democracy, yes, even for terrible people. Senator Kamala Harris just said we should have that conversation. She didn't really answer one way or another. What do you think? Should people convicted of sexual assault of the Boston Marathon bomber, should they be able to vote? While incarcerated? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Uh, I. <laughs> I do believe that when you are out, when you have served your sentence, then uh, part of being restored to society is that you are part of the political life of this nation again. And one of the things that needs to be restored is your right to vote. As you know, some states and, and communities do it, some don't. I think we'd be a better country if everybody did it. And frankly, I think the motivations for preventing that kind of reenfranchisement in, in some cases have to do with one side of the aisle noticing that they politically benefit uh, from, from that. And that's got some racial layers too. So that's one of many reasons that I, agree, I believe that uh, reenfranchisement 
chastisement upon release is important, but but part of the punishment when you were uh, when you were convicted of a crime and you're incarcerated is you lo- lose certain rights, you lose your freedom, uh, and I think during that period uh, it does not make sense to to have an exception for the right to vote. Look, I guess on one level I get it. I get why some politicians, including people who approach things like Pete Buttigieg, would say that. He got applause. And why not? In America, like we approach prison and the purpose of prison differently than a lot of other countries, like countries in Europe and stuff like that. We have been trained to think of these people, even those who have not committed violent offenses and all that, as fundamentally bad people. And so, yeah, speaking out and saying that there should be more, you know, more penalties, more restrictions, all of that is going to be popular with a lot of people. I get it. I don't think that it's morally right. I don't think that it's wise necessarily. And I do think that it sucks that in, when he makes the case that he just did, when uh, Tucker Carlson was attacking the ballot measure in Florida the last time around, nobody feels the need to actually explain why philosophically they should not be able to vote. And saying when you go to prison, there are certain restrictions is not an explanation. I, I, that's an avenue to future cruelty, I guess. Okay, when you go to prison, um, I think everyone in prison should be blindfolded. And if you think that's cruel, well, when you go to prison, there are certain restrictions. I think they should have to walk around on their knees. Why not? They're in prison, they're bad people. I should have to explain why. Why should they be blindfolded? Why shouldn't they be able to vote? I know it's silly. I, I go to extremes in jokes and sometimes, but. Explain why, what are you worried will happen if they are able to vote? What are they gonna vote for? Which candidate is gonna get into office on the back of felons that you are so worried about, that you are willing to restrict everyone else in prison who is not a violent offender, who is not a murderer, who is not a rapist from voting? And again, the slippery slope that I talked about with Bernie Sanders, like. I do not want to be on that side of this argument. I don't want to be deciding that certain groups of people cannot be trusted with the vote. Because there are a lot of people in America who don't want that to stop with people currently serving prison terms. There's a lot of people who don't want when you get out of prison to be able to vote. There's like, if it's a trust thing, okay, people with bad credit, can we really trust them to be voting on economic policies or choosing people who are gonna determine the future of the economy? People who. Like people with toxic social media histories, can we really trust them to choose the right type of person? Like, okay, maybe that's a little bit harder to imagine, but there are people who want to imagine that, who want to move us in that direction. And that is why we have to be as vigorous and passionate in our defense of democratic rights as those who seek to restrict those rights. And not have this like, I don't really want to offend anyone, I just want to have it kind of easy, you know, like, nah, felons, you know, maybe. Nah, not not the vote. That's too much. Maybe when they get out, that sort of road. When that's one side, and the other side is we want to restrict as much voting as possible. What you get is restrictions, not expansions, and that is why I hate that answer so much. Anyway, let's move on to other issues. Elizabeth Warren had a good town hall, genuinely good all around. One of her strongest answers, though, was on what should happen in terms of impeachment of Donald Trump, and here she is. But this really is fundamentally. I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And so did everybody else in the Senate and in the House. And I believe that every person in the Senate and the House ought to have to vote and to say either, yeah, that's okay with me. Yeah, let a president just step in the way he did when he told the White House counsel to go fire Mueller. And then told the White House counsel to go lie about having told the White House counsel to go fire Mueller. And then told the White House counsel to write a letter saying that Donald Trump had not told him to go fire Mueller. And then to say, why on earth would you take notes about what I said to you? The lawyers I deal with never put anything in writing. If there are people in the House or the Senate who want to say that's what a president can do when the president is being investigated for his own wrongdoings or when a foreign government attacks our country, then they should have to take that vote and live with it for the rest of their lives. That is like, that is such a strong answer, particularly out of Elizabeth Warren. And when I say that, I mean that she is great at explaining her positions on the issues in a way that is comprehensive, deep, and also understandable. But she doesn't normally get really fired up 
And like, I think she was shaking a little bit because of how much she cares about this. And understand, it's not like Elizabeth Warren has not been like ringing the bell on impeachment for Donald Trump, like for the last two years or anything. She has kept her cards very close to her chest, but obviously she takes the responsibility that has been vested in her by the Constitution very seriously in a way that few other senators on either side of the aisle are are willing to do. There are a lot of people who their position is just, we'll leave it up to the voters, we'll have an election, whatever happens, happens. That is a scary prospect from my point of view. Donald Trump's willingness thus far as president to abide by norms and traditions, regulations, even laws. All the context that we have on that is when he is being actively investigated and is worried about the consequences. And even then, a lot of his actions have been scary, have been in the case of obstruction of justice, I think, illegal. Can you imagine how he is going to act when that has been lifted from him? And he no longer worries about an active investigation. He doesn't have to worry about a future investigation because he knows that nothing is gonna come of it, that nobody's gonna hold him accountable. What will he not do? Now that he has been freed up, now that he can act the way he's always wanted to. Not a lot of people are taking that responsibly, but Elizabeth Warren is. We're gonna have poll results a little bit later on the show. Some scary stuff, some cause for, for a little bit of hope, but also some scary stuff as well. We're gonna have a little bit more on some of the other candidates' positions on impeachment too. But I do wanna take a break because when we come back, Sarah Kleiner is gonna be joining us from the Center for Public Integrity. We're gonna be talking about Tim Ryan, his presidential bid, and how exactly he's funding the whole thing after this. Part of our ongoing series, breaking down the fundraising and financing of the different Democratic primary candidates. We turn now to Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan and joining us on the show with some excellent reporting on this is a federal politics reporter at the Center for Public Integrity, Sarah Kleiner. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Hi, John, thanks so much for having me. Always glad to have you on. So for people who might not be familiar with Tim Ryan, who is he and why does he appear to be running? So he's a longtime congressman from Northeast Ohio. Um, he is a moderate uh, Democrat. Uh, he's business friendly but socially liberal, kind of like John Hickenlooper, who we've talked about before. Um, he is running because he feels like he can be a bridge between Rust Belt voters, white, uh, blue collar voters. Um, especially ones in the Midwest around where he is from. Uh, and sort of uh, the faction of the party that is moving further to the left, um, mm. more liberal voters. Um, he feels like he can bridge the gap, whereas other candidates cannot. Um, he is from a part of the country where voters in his district, actually uh, three of the five counties in his Northeast Ohio district voted for Donald Trump. and. Um, and he was still elected in this district. Interesting. Uh, so it seems like he he might be trying to go down the same lane as like a Joe Biden or sort of a, a different formulation of the message of a Bernie Sanders uh, to some extent. Exactly right. He um, he and some of the other candidates have uh, sort of bet on the fact that they're going to be able to uh, attract voters uh, that uh, closer to the middle. Uh, yeah probably in the general election rather than uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren who are pushing uh, to the left. So uh, I have to ask you a few of the questions I ask you pretty much every time we do one of these, just so we understand a couple of the, the big components that go into financing a, a presidential uh, bid. Uh, personal wealth, uh, ability to fund his campaign himself, uh, how does he rank up uh, compared to some of the others? So he actually is not nearly, he does not nearly have the wealth that a lot of the other candidates have. We uh, we know Elizabeth Warren is a very wealthy candidate. There are others who have millions of dollars um, stockpiled if they need it in personal wealth. He is not among those. Uh, his wealth actually is, uh, it could, it depend. the uh, candidates have to report their wealth in ranges, their assets and their liabilities in ranges. And if you, um, his could actually potentially be in the whole. Oh, interesting. And so uh, that's his personal wealth. Um, in terms of uh, like pr previously stockpiled money from past bids or anything like that, does he enter with anything like a war chest? Not really, no. Um, he's He has a long way to go in terms of fundraising. He has uh, his 
congressional uh, coffer uh, spent almost all of the money that it had raised um, toward the end of the year last year. And so he, some other candidates, um, I know I keep going back to Warren, but uh, she basically was able to carry over a ton of money and, mm -hmm. you know, poised and ready to go to spend it on ads and, and the like. Um, so with Tim Ryan, he has a lot of ground to make up. That's interesting. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the way that he might try to make up that ground. Uh, in as you pointed out, he's been a congressman for some time. Um, are there trends in uh, like corporate backing for him? Any particular industries that are that are generally supportive of Tim Ryan that he might be able to rely on? Actually, um, that's a really good question, and he has. Um, Right now, he's in a part of the state that I would like to point out is uh, where General Motors, General Motors has a plant that has closed down in his part of the state. And he and the United Auto Workers um, have worked together. Uh, they have uh, basically blasted President Trump for his uh, tweet storm about United Auto Workers. So I know that uh, Tim Ryan and the auto workers are uh, pretty close uh, there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so President Trump uh, went on a tweet storm and was critical of the plant of General Motors for closing there. Um, and Tim Ryan defended uh, defended the company and said, you know, and defended the the union, the workers there, and said that they've done their best to try to get these jobs back, but it just hasn't been successful. Okay, and in terms of uh, uh, small dollar donations, uh, one of the, the requiring factors to make it on the debate stage, um, historically, how has he done uh, in that area? Right, so right now he's, he's making a pitch. He actually has made a pitch for even a dollar. He says, if I can get enough of these $1 contributions, I can at least make it onto the stage. Um, so Bernie Sanders has totally blown other candidates away when it comes to small dollar contributions. Um, he has pulled in uh, something like 80, 85 percent of his donations have been from small dollar donors. Um, Tim Ryan is lagging behind in that department as well. Um, and so it, as is John Hickenlooper, he's not alone. Um, John Hickenlooper is on the other end of that spectrum as well, huh. um, something around 10 percent. Interesting. And uh, I noticed uh, in your, your, your write up about this, which people should take a look at because there's a lot more details in there. Um, he appears specifically to be having trouble fundraising from women in comparison to some of the other candidates, is that correct? Right, right. Um, we uh, we did an analysis, and uh, it's on our website, uh, publicintegrity.org. Um, we did an analysis uh, around the end of the year, beginning of this year, that looked at women who donated to political campaigns. And um, I worked on this with Carrie Levine, a senior mm -hmm. uh, politics reporter here. And basically what we found is that women were very influential in the midterms in 2018. And from what we talked to women across the country, and they are going to be uh, a a force to be reckoned with uh, in 2020. Their their energy is uh, is maintaining. They say they still feel like they have work to do. Um, so again, that's a, that's another area where Tim Ryan needs to. Um, he's going to have to capture uh, women donors um, and women voters in order to be successful. Okay, well, uh, as always, Sarah, uh, we appreciate you uh, coming on the show and breaking down your reporting. And uh, for people watching, uh, you, you mentioned the website, uh, publicintegrity.org. Uh, there's write ups on Tim Ryan uh, and most of the other candidates at this point. That's right, uh, right? right basically we're everyone. We're up to 19 at this point, and we'll 19. see this with Biden. Okay, well, we've actually missed a few. We're going to have to go back through and check which ones we missed and have you back on uh, to break those down. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, we're going to take a short break here. We come back. Uh, a little bit more from the town halls. We're running out of time, but I'm gonna see what I can do. So in DC, Democrats are having their own internal debate about what should be done after the release of the Mueller report. Should be, there be more investigations? Should there potentially be impeachment proceedings? And they're going back and forth about the potential political like, like consequences of doing that. I know that while all this is going on, what the people actually think about it is largely irrelevant, but I'm still interested in it. So I was interested in this new HuffPost YouGov poll showing different ways that people have interpreted the Mueller report, what they've learned from it. And also, by the way, from the narratives around it, which have been driven by things like Barr's press conference, the Barr memo, and all of that. But 
With all that context, here are a few things that stood out to me. By a 10 point margin, 45% to 35%, people who've heard at least something about the report's release say it does not entirely clear Trump, another 20% aren't sure. That's just a little bit depressing because it specifically says that it does not exonerate him on obstruction of justice. Maybe people answering that are thinking about conspiracy. Um, and then there's, they're a little bit unclear or whatever, but it's not ambiguous when it comes to obstruction of justice. It specifically says it does not exonerate him and it describes a number of things that to me read as obstruction-y. And so I look, I guess some of the base on Trump's side are never going to be convinced. We've got some more evidence of that. But if you want to live in a reality based world, that is a disheartening poll result. Um, here's another one, 73% of Trump voters say it quote, does not reveal anything damaging, anything at all. Now look, I get it, not a lot of Trump supporters are going to read the Mueller report regardless of what it says and say, "Oh, I don't MAGA anymore, I get that. But doesn't reveal anything damaging, I mean, he lies repeatedly throughout it. I mean, why did he lie to cover up uh, the Trump Tower meeting? Why did he lie about wanting to get Mueller fired? Why did he try to fire him in the first place? Now, if you're a Trump supporter, you can say, I, at, in the end, I think the Trump Tower meeting was fine, or I think he should be able to fire Mueller, okay. But it's suspicious to lie about it, it's suspicious to cover it up. To say that it doesn't reveal anything damaging means that three out of four Trump voters are implacable, they're unreachable, they're unconvincible about anything because they won't admit to any issue whatsoever. And that overall is a far bigger trend that I'm very scared about for American politics. You need to be willing to acknowledge both the good and the bad on a policy, on a value, on a politician. For instance, I support Bernie Sanders. I didn't quite get to it today, but I was gonna do a segment on how I disagree with something that he said in the town hall about impeachment of Donald Trump. I disagree with him on that. Still a supporter. I don't feel like an existential crisis about the future of my support for Bernie Sanders because I can admit that I don't agree with him on everything. I had a talk with, with Craig in one of the breaks about a few ways that he answers questions that I would finesse if I was one of his advisors. Doesn't mean I'm not a supporter of his. Trump voters, a lot of them don't have that level of nuance, unfortunately. Now, this is a little bit of good news, I guess, mixed with some bad news. 43% to 34%, so a plurality, say that they believe Trump attempted to obstruct Mueller's investigation. Look, believe that he tried to obstruct it is beating didn't, but only 43% say that he tried when it says that he, he asked someone to fire Mueller. And again, I guess, I guess I'm gonna go to my grave just bashing my brains in with my own hands over my inability to get people to acknowledge what seems like incontrovertible. If you think you can fire the person investigating you, that's the worst way that you can obstruct justice. If you can stop the investigation, what else? Like, what, what game are we playing at this point? If you could do that, what do we care about any of the rest of it? And still, it just narrowly beats out. 1% of Trump voters say they think the report shows that Trump is unfit for the presidency. So, to those 1% of Trump voters, you guys are the special ones. I don't even know. I, like that's pretty amazing. We we got one percent. We're number one percent. Uh, only two percent of Hillary Clinton voters say they don't find it at all damaging. Uh, I don't think that those are valid statements, though. <laughs> of course, there's things that are damaging in it. I don't know why those two percent of Hillary Clinton voters are like, checks out. That's weird. This is not balanced. Anyway, overall, what effect has it had? I, we don't know for sure, the polls bounce around and all that. I don't wanna go to, to go too crazy about any one poll, but I did see this poll. Trump approval sinks five points after Mueller report, tying all time low. Tying all time low, not dropping to new lows, not hitting 20% or anything like that. And we will look at other polls and all that, but a five point drop in a short period of time is, is not nothing. And especially when he and you know state media over Fox News have been doing everything they can to portray this as a unilateral win for him, that's still something. So mixed results there, much to be concerned about, but interesting results nonetheless. With that said, you know, thank you for watching this episode. I apologize if my voice got a little bit rough there. I'm dealing with a bit of a sore throat, gonna deal with it. 
But we got exciting things coming for the rest of the week. JR is here tomorrow. Uh, we've got David K. Johnston, Michael Brooks is gonna be in studio on Thursday. So much fun coming up. So uh, thank you for joining us on today's episode and we will see you tomorrow morning with a lot more news. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.